All right. Well, it is 845. So I am going to let President Andrew Dorsey take it from here. Good morning, everybody. Thank you, Molly. Um, first, I want to just give a shout out to Molly and Drew for helping organize this and being the behind the scenes uh, folks who pulled this all together. So thank you very much. And a shout out to Gene Runyon, who uh, I think had some of the conception and uh, knew Una and James and was able to uh, enlist them in the service of this event. So thank you, Gene, and thank you for chairing the OER committee. And uh, just a shout out to all the Front Range folks who I see here who have been involved in OER. Um, I know Ken was one of the early leaders I see, and I know, Noelle, you've been engaged. Uh, I, I'm going to miss tons of people, so I won't go through everybody, but I know that I'm really impressed by the number of people who have really dug in and tried to find ways to make resources more accessible to students and really more um, customizable to the courses so you can really teach the way you want to teach. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to the day. I'm looking forward uh, not only to hearing what Una and James have to say, I've got to go in between, so I'll just try to pop in and out, but also what some of our own folks can, can share about what you guys are doing, because I think um, we were a little slow off the mark in OER, but um, we have a number of folks who are really catching up and i um, happy to see that so many of you were uh, engaging in the OER grant process and looking forward to what that brings. So without further ado, Molly, I'll turn it back to you and, and uh, uh, thank you all for being here very much. All right, good morning. And thank you for attending today. We are so glad you're here and we are glad that you could log in. That was our biggest worry for the week. So hopefully you've had a chance to look at the agenda. After our wonderful keynote session, we have two sets of breakout sessions. The breakout sessions end at noon. And after the breakout sessions, I wanted to remind you that Ken Monks put together a fun virtual beach room for us in Gather Town. So you can move your avatar by using the arrow buttons on your keyboard. And there is a poster session room as well. And you can see what other people at Front Range have done with OER so far. So take a look at that. And the posters are located on the north side of the room. So you just have to move your avatar using the up arrow button to the north side. Um, so it's really fun. So I encourage you to check it out. And that's at noon. I also wanted to thank all of the members of the OER Council for their work on OER throughout the years and also with this conference. A lot of them are presenting today, so thank you so much. Some of them are presenting in two sessions. I really appreciate it. And thank you to others who have also stepped up to help out. I also wanted to give a shout out to Drew Bagby, a librarian who has set up all the Zoom links um, he's kind of become an expert on Zoom in the last month, so thank you very much. And I hope all of you have an enjoyable morning, and thank you again so much for attending. And I'm going to turn it over to Jean. Good morning, everyone. This is truly a pleasure. Um, Una and James and I first collaborated, I think, back in 2001, when we were working on a project um, called Bridges to Success with the Open University MIT and also the University of Maryland and University College. And then our paths have crossed, you know, passed uh, very often in the last decade. And so let me just tell you a little bit about them. Una is the director of the Community College Consortium for Open Educational Resources at the Open Education Global, a community of practice for open with college members across the United States. Um, and many of you know that we are a member of the consortium and you can sign up and you can attend free webinars and join the listserv. It's an amazing group of practitioners across the United States and even internationally that are really contributing um, to open. So, and Una is a national leader in the open education movement for over a decade. And she most recently partnered with both the California Community College Zero Textbook Cost, uh, Zero Textbook Cost Degree Program and Achieving the Dreams OER Degree Initiative. And so have made tremendous impact impact in the world of open. And James is the Dean of Educational Technology, Learning Resources and Distance Learning at the College of the Canyons. Both of them are in sunny California today. Um, James has served as a principal investigator, fiscal agent and technical assistance provider on many initiatives, um, not only locally in California, but also throughout the United States. 
He's recognized as a global leader in open education, numerous awards. And in 2018, he was recognized by Open Ed, um, Education uh, Global as the top 10 global influencer in OER in the past decade. And in 2019, he received the President's Award for advancing open education around the world through his exceptional dedication, outstanding contribution, and exemplary service. And I can attest to the impact that both Una and James have had on student success, reducing barriers, and just on open. So it is truly a pleasure to have them with us today. So I'm gonna turn it over to Una and James. All right, thank you, Jean. And let me just bring up my slides. Get that going. All right. Good morning, everyone. Um, we are just thrilled to be here with you this morning. Um, I would say it's a little earlier here in California. I'm up in Northern California. James is in sunny Southern California. It's a little cooler where I am, <laughs> but we are just so thrilled to be here. Um, and our talk today is on the why of open educational resources. And um, we hope that this will be <laughs> a helpful overview for you. And um, I want to give James, a chance to say hello as well. Thanks, Una. Good morning, everybody. Sorry we can't be there in person. I sure look forward to a, uh, an in-person visit at some point in, 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 the, in the future. Uh, and thank you, Jean, for your very kind introduction. And, and, and Molly, thank you for all your help organizing everything. It's a really admirable job of organizing. So thanks. Yes, I reiterate that. Thanks, Jean, for the invitation and Molly and all the rest of the folks who've worked with us. We had set this up for the in-person event back in May. And of course, that uh, had to uh, be canceled. So we are, we are really thrilled to be here virtually. So here's our, here's our ride for the keynote. We're going to um, take you through a little bit of an overview uh, and then making the case. Um, how OER can support equity, getting your students involved, amplifying marginalized voices, accessibility, and then how to, how to get into the community if you want to participate more, and we hope that you will. All right, so first up, <laughs> this wasn't our first slide, actually, and James this morning said, you know, and we should put the definition in first, and, and of course he was correct. So um, freely available learning materials that can be copied edited and shared to better serve all students. Um, and so this is, this is a, a kind of an amalgamation of a, a few other definitions, but it hits the main points there that this is about serving students and it gives freedom for not only faculty, but we hope also students to uh, contribute and participate in their educational materials. So, my question to you is, do you know when the term open educational resources was first uh, coined? What year? <laughs> and I imagine we have some ringers here. I'm going to try and bring up my chat window so I can see what's uh, happening here. Oh, and I, of course, rushed right over it while I'm waiting for someone to type into the chat window. Uh, I'll, I'll give you a hint. It was it was in the 21st century. Um, so, uh, yeah. Okay, no guesses yet? Or my, oh, okay, thank you, thank you, David, David and Stacy. <laughs> oh yeah, you guys are pretty close, uh, Stacy and, uh, and Julie and Jennifer. Um, so also we wanted to ask you to introduce yourself in the chat window, and I'm sorry, I forgot to say that. Um, so please do introduce yourself in the chat window and tell us what you teach. Uh, that's always fun for us to hear and um, can help us uh, direct you to things. Okay, great, great. Oh, oh, Molly, come on. <laughs> She's a ringer. Yep, it was 2002. And it was at a UNESCO meeting that the term open educational resources was first used. Uh, but it was still pretty early days. Um, there was the Cape Town Declaration of Open Education uh, that was done in Cape Town, South Africa in 2007. And that was the first really uh, public announcement of it. Um, and, and that we just celebrated the 10 year anniversary of that in 2017. And so the Shuttleworth Foundation and the Open Society Foundation sponsored that declaration um, in 2007. Um, since that time, there was the UNESCO uh, 
declaration of OER in 2012. Um, and James, you're going to have to help me here. Hundreds of countries around the world signed up to this OER declaration. Uh, OE Global was there. I, I personally wasn't, um, since I deal more with the domestic side of things, but it was a very exciting um, endorsement of the idea of open educational resources around the world. And um, most recently, in November of 2019, there was the OER recommendation from UNESCO. And this is actually a really big deal. This doesn't happen very often that UNESCO uh, comes behind and recommends uh, OER as a way to ensure sustainable education, inclusive access. Um, and so there is a number of organizations, I think you probably will recognize some of these, um, Creative Commons, Spark, the Commonwealth of Learning, um, ICDE, um, an institute in Ljubljana that's been very active in this area, Ljubljana, Slovenia, um, to, to help countries around the world uh, drive capacity um, in open education in order to uh, produce sustainable education for all. And this really plays into the UN sustainability development goals, um, which I hope um, you're somewhat aware of, but which is all about making education available for all and you know clean environment there's 17 of them right james so oe global itself was founded about 2007 or 8 i'm not absolutely sure um, and it came out of the work done at mit around open courseware uh, but it very quickly became a uh, global movement and now we have um, over 240 members in 44 countries and we recently added k through 12 um, in the last year. So we're really excited to have both higher ed and K through 12 working on this together. And we sponsor a number of events throughout the year. Um, an annual conference, which we had in November, actually it was virtual, but there's the Open Education Awards and um, where we uh, recognize um, outstanding open education uh, leaders and projects uh, annually. Um, and we also have Open Ed Week, and I'll, I will mention that a, a little bit later about that opportunity to get involved and to use Open Ed Week on your campus, and I, I'm sure that Molly and other folks uh, do that today. Now, CCCOER, um, and as Jean mentioned, we, we're so uh, proud to have Front Range as a member, um, has been around since 2007. Um, and it's all about improving student equity and success. But we do that through um, supporting faculty choice and development. We do a lot of professional development, monthly webinars, um, other um, training for our members in addition to those. And um, we, uh, in the last few years, have really been trying to engage with regional OER leadership because we know how important those statewide programs are and uh, very excited with the work that Colorado has done over the last three years. And we have had uh, your Department of Higher Ed folks participating in our regional leadership um, along with um, the Community College Online folks. Um, I'm sure you folks all know these people. Oops, all right. there we go. So um, I know that there's been some great work over the last three years. And of course there was, I'm sure plenty of work building up to this. Um, Molly's scanning the slide. I hope I got this all accurate. Um, Brittany Dudak, who is uh, Community Colleges Online. She's the library, librarian there. She is on my executive council. And so she, she keeps me up to date on all the great stuff. And I understand that the third round is gonna be announced um, in February, the third, in, uh, the third round of OER grants. And I know that you also, Front Range received one um, last year for early childhood education. Um, so really excited. And um, I see that your state legislature has uh, set in motion a um, requirement for notification of OER and low cost courses starting um, in 2021. So very excited to hear about all that really great progress. And I'm <laughs> that was the overview and I am now gonna turn this over to James. Great, thank you, Una. So we're gonna start talking, diving into the why of open, open educational resources and openness generally. And I'm gonna start off with this image. I love this image for a couple of reasons. First of all, uh, well, this image is uh, an image that we use at my home institution to promote open educational resources. And I love the image for a couple of reasons. First of all, it was created by one of our students. So I love the idea that students are involved in, in our OER projects at, at, at my institution and increasingly in a lot of institutions. But I also love the sense of 
sort of surprise that this image conveys, speaking to students like, can you believe it? This is too good to be true. Free textbooks, no way. You know, what are you gonna think of next? Well, if we pause for a second and, and think about what all the great things that our institutions do, we in the community colleges, right, whose mission is an open access mission, we do a lot of things that are really too good to be true if you think about it. And I'm gonna walk through just a couple of those to, to try to make a, a larger point. So next slide, please, Una. So I know you're a Pathways institution and you know we are, we're, we're thinking about getting students on the path, entering the path. And so if a student wants to see one of your uh, Pathways advisors, um, what do they have to do? They make an appointment, you know, they matriculate, they make an appointment, but do you charge them extra money? Do you charge your students extra money to see a Pathways advisor? No, of course not. That sounds absurd, doesn't it? Because we think it's good for the students, it's helpful for the students to see those pathway advisors. And we also probably suspect that if we charge them an extra fee, they wouldn't really go. So next slide, please. One way to get students on the path and keep students on the path, particularly our students with disabilities, is to make sure that they have the appropriate accommodations. And of course, that our classes are designed to be accessible to start with but many of our students need accommodations in order to stay on the path. And let's think about this. Do we charge our students an extra fee for testing accommodations? Do we charge our students an extra fee for note-taking services? Do we charge our students an, an extra fee if they need to see Peggy Copeland or Kath Steger? No, we, it sounds absurd to us. We know that these services are very helpful to, for our students. And we also suspect that gosh, if we charge our students an extra fee for these services, they might not be able to use these services, right? Next slide, please. And you probably get where I'm going with this. Next slide, Una, please. Thank you. So uh, we also build beautiful buildings or renovate beautiful buildings or renovate buildings to be beautiful um, so that our students have a place to hang out on campus, right? They can come visit us in our offices, sort of in the before times, <laughs> maybe not right now, but in the before times, students would come, come and visit us in our offices. They'd, they'd have a coffee together. They'd bump into their professors on campus. They'd hang out. And that's a way of keeping students on the path, isn't it? And of course, these buildings don't build themselves by themselves. They don't uh, get renovated for free. That costs real money. I'm sure Gene uh, can tell you, you know, more than you want to know about how much money it costs to renovate buildings or build new buildings. And we don't charge students an extra fee to hang around in the buildings, whether it's the library or the student center or in our offices. We don't charge them an extra fee because we know it's good for them to be on campus or to interact with us, to build community and we suspect that if we charge them an extra fee, they wouldn't do that, right? So you're getting the picture now, I bet. Next slide, please. And also in the before times, we provided students with free Wi-Fi on campus. Well, provided everybody with free Wi-Fi on campus, didn't we? Now that costs way more than you ever could suspect. It's certainly not free for the institution or the taxpayers. And yet we provide the free Wi-Fi for students for all kinds of reasons. We know it's good for them, et cetera, et cetera. And yet, <laughs> what, what, what do we do uh, with uh, the instructional materials? We know that it's good for students to use the instructional materials, dear faculty, noble faculty that you, that you work hard to select for your students. And we suspect that if we charge them an extra fee, they might not be able to use those instructional materials, right? Just like those other services. And yet we, not Fort Range, not the evil administrators at Fort Range or the evil administrators myself at my institution, but we, the collective we in higher education have decided for some insane reason to stick the students with this cost. One of the most essential components of the educational experience and one of the most important decisions that you faculty make is outsourced, right, to third parties. It's just, it's just a, crazy, a, a, a crazy situation, I think, that we, we provide our students with so many things that are too good to be true, and yet one of the essential components of the learning is outsourced. So let that sit with us for a moment. We'll move on. We know that uh, one of the reasons uh, outsourcing the cost of textbooks to, to third parties and, and 
putting it on the backs of our students is a problem is of course the cost. Uh, you've either seen this slide or similar images uh, informing us that textbook costs go up and up and up and up, right? You know, it's, it's old news by now, isn't it? It's old news. This, this slide shows us that uh, textbook costs have gone up around 1,500% in the past generation. So, you know, we know that. What's the consequence of that? Next slide, please. Consequence is this number. Uh, anybody want to guess what this number represents? $1.6 trillion. What is that number? That's, that's what this... Yes, debt, exactly. Thank you, Thomas. Uh, student loan debt in the United States uh, doesn't take an economist to tell us this, this represents not only a personal uh, burden for the uh, debt holders, but also a burden on the economy. Uh, people delay purchases, people delay marriage, people delay, delay doing all kinds of things because they're trying to, to pay off this debt. Uh, we see this, this impact elsewhere. Next slide, please. Uh, you know, in, in the stories of our students, this is a quote from a, a, a survey that Reedley College out in California did with their students. This is one of the, one of the uh, open comments uh, that they received. Student says, because of textbooks, I took a lot of time off school just because I couldn't afford the textbooks. Even after I became a student, purchasing the textbook was the hardest part. Think about that, folks. You take your discipline seriously. Whoops, whoops, keep back. Thank you. Thank you. You take your discipline seriously. You want critical thinking. <laughs> you want the, your discipline to be the hardest thing for students, right? The, 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 not, not these things outside the realm of learning. So this, this kind of makes me sad. Next slide, please. Luna. Thank you. Uh, and, and we know uh, there's no getting around it. The textbook racket is big business. The commercial textbook racket. These numbers represent revenue of the U.S. higher education textbook market. In 2016, the revenue was 3.6 billion, and in 2019, the revenue went down. It was 3.2 billion only. It's going down steadily. It's going down steadily. And yet, let's take a look at what is happening now. Next slide, please. This is from the Association of American Publishers. So this is industry data. The data here represents sales, comparing sales in October of 2019 to sales in October of 2020. And you'll see on the right-hand side where the yellow arrow is pointing, uh, higher education course materials, the sales were up 280% over the past year, 280%. So, <laughs> Our students are not being relieved of this horrible burden at this moment in time, despite some of the publicity that uh, textbook publishers would like, commercial textbook publishers would like us to believe. And talk to your librarians. Uh, Pearson, Cengage, and McGraw-Hill simply refuse to do business with us. They will not sell us an e-textbook. They'll sell us general, general, not general fiction, general nonfiction, but they won't sell us uh, electronic versions of textbooks uh, to substitute for the reserve textbooks that your library might previously have provided in person. So that's just a picture of what's going on out there, folks. Next slide, please. Uh, the result, though, is, is besides the, the cost barrier, we have this cynicism, this attitude that's being created on, with our students. Another student at Reedley College said, the system sucks. Only people with money can go to college. So poor people stay poor and rich people get to stay rich. The system is rigged against the poor. You know, the, the choice of words tears my heart out, right? That, 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 that uh, students view us this way, right? This is us. Next slide, please. Students view us like this. This is what students think we are, right? That we're part of this system that is nickel and diming them to death. But that's not why we went into education. Uh, next slide, please. Let's let's go back to some reasonable propositions. What do we what do we educators? I think all of us, but certainly in the open education world, we think are reasonable reasonable propositions. We'd like students to have materials on the first day of class. We think it's reasonable that online materials should be free, because the marginal cost of duplicating the slideshow is zero. You right click and copy, and it's free. Uh, but of course, a low cost print option, paper and ink, costs something. 
Uh, we, of course, want our content to be relevant and current, particularly in our, our career education areas. And colleagues, you should be in control of the content, not Pearson Publishers with its headquarters in London. Uh, you should be in control of the content. You presumably went to grad school because you know stuff. You wanted to learn stuff. You know stuff, and you should be in control of the content. Next slide, please. So, James, I wonder if we had a little comment. We had a few comments in the sure. chat. You know? And Kathy Absolutely. mentions, she said, I hope one of our guests, and of course I'm going to be mean and give it to James, can speak to the added time burden involved in developing OER. Absolutely. That faculty control comes with a cost. A absolutely, absolutely, and I and I believe we we heard. Uh, I, I think that was your president who was speaking uh, uh, earlier. Referred to your grant program, and uh, and we certainly know that uh, that uh, the state of Colorado has invested heavily uh, in supporting open educational resource development and uh, adaptation. Uh, I don't know the details of that program, but generally, what we see across the United States uh, is that uh, institutions of higher education that have successful and uh, sustainable open education programs uh, honor the work of their faculty and staff and administrators who, uh, whose labor it takes to create a program and maintain a program uh, and that comes in the form often of stipends or release time for faculty members who are the subject matter experts doing the, doing the intellectual labor. Uh, it comes oftentimes in the forms of uh, staff time, either hourly staff or permanent staff who are supporting the OER uh, development and adaptation. So certainly I think uh, it, would be, I would, it would be difficult for me to think of anyone in the open education space uh, who would be opposed to honoring the labor of colleagues who, who help to, to develop OER programs. I hope that answers the question. Yeah, I, um, yeah. Thank you, James. And I, I can't speak, but I'm, we can ask um, the the person who um, who proposed that question. I'm sorry, I it's scrolled off my screen. Um, but um, you know, James does speak to it's a different model um, when faculty have control, and it is something that the institution needs to be aware of. Um, and I know that uh, there's been a department at James's college because I've had the opportunity to work with them in the, um, over the years in sociology and all of their uh, courses use open textbooks and they have a model around updating those open textbooks uh, where they, uh, the other faculty are involved and um, receive stipends. They also work with graduate students in sociology at the local state university who provide some of that over oversight uh, as the work is being done. So um, it, it is a new model and uh, those grants um, and having institutional funding ongoing to support that work is really key. Right, and, and, and I'll say as a, as a certified bean counting paper pushing administrator, uh, it's, it's not sustainable for an individual institution on its own to keep investing. Uh, in new development. Uh, of course, one of the wonders of OER is that uh, content that's developed in California can be repurposed for use in Colorado. Um, but it also points to the need uh, for state investment. Uh, and I'm, I don't know the details in Colorado, but certainly federal student aid and in California, state student aid can be used to purchase instructional materials. Uh, well, guess what? Uh, rather than the state year after year after year after year after year giving, giving that financial aid to the commercial publishers, the state could use that money and reinvest that money into OER support at a, at a state level. So it, for me, it's a matter of changing our perspective. If we go back to my examples about uh, pathway advisors, uh, disability services and accommodations, uh, libraries, uh, student centers, Wi-Fi, those are all costs that one way or another institutions and states have chosen to absorb. Uh, states could choose it, could choose to pass along the cost to students, but they have chosen not to. Uh, and I submit that it, it's the same, we, we can make the same choice with learning materials. So hope and that answered that question. 
Yeah, and the only thing I would add is that, you know, as we pay for students to purchase these textbooks year after year, it's really, uh, it, it's a throwaway cost in the sense that uh, the students use it, but the book may not come back into the system. But with OER, as you're developing this, this can be used in multiple classrooms, um, multiple professors, it can be used year after year, it can be shared among the states. Um, so it's it's not a one time cost that um, that that is it is not recouped. So I think that's important that OER is something that's an ongoing thing and, and those investment dollars continue to be driving um, student success. All right, good. Thank you, Una. Thanks for thanks for pointing out that question. So, so this all leads us back to OER, right? As 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 not the only way, but a certainly uh, increasingly uh, recognized way to provide students with relevant and current content and uh, content that is controlled by faculty. Uh, next slide, please. If you do choose to go down this path, you will not be alone. Perhaps you've seen this slide before, this this chart before. This is from a 2020 uh, national survey of U.S. higher education. Uh, the top bar with the yellow arrow indicates that across the United States in 2018-19, uh, amongst faculty who teach introductory courses, so us in the community colleges, 26% utilized open educational resources. So again, you, you are not alone if you choose to go down this path. This is the trend in higher education for many reasons. We talked about the cost and we'll talk a little bit later about other reasons. Uh, next slide, please. Ooh, sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, and and we this is this is a statistic from my institution, and I presume you have this statistic from your institution, or or you will have. Um, we know we ask our students in our annual student survey what barriers do you experience, what influences your enrollment decisions, um, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Sort of the customer satisfaction uh, feedback. 70% uh, of our students tell us that textbook costs influence their enrollment. So again, as a, as a bean counting administrator, I think that open education is a, an enrollment management issue. Our students will take more classes and uh, exit the institution successfully uh, sooner uh, in shorter time uh, if we do move towards OER and remove that textbook barrier. So it's, a, it's, a, it's an administrative imperative, not just a, a noble faculty imperative. Next slide. Uh, also, uh, there's a lot, of, a lot of evidence, growing body of research that demonstrates the ways in which adopting OER reduces the equity gaps. This slide illustrates results of a survey, survey at the University of Georgia a couple of years ago with an N of 22,000. Uh, and it compared two semesters, fall semester, same instructor, same course, commercial materials, spring semester, same instructor, same course, OER materials. And we can see what changed in terms of the grades and the drops, fails, withdrawals, the, the, this quote unquote unsuccessful uh, course attempts. Uh, let's, let's scroll down to the fourth uh, row uh, entitled non-white. That's the choice of, that's the terminology of the researchers. Um, in moving to OER, the grades of these students went up 13%, the drops, fails, and withdrawals went down 5%, and so on. So we, we all know that we're trying to reduce, reduce equity gaps uh, or the achievement gap uh, in, in higher education. And again, an increasing body of knowledge, a body of research tells us that uh, moving to OER helps with that. Next slide. Uh, quick point about uh, a project that we've done in California to help uh, support colleges to develop what are termed zero textbook cost degrees or ZTC or Z degrees. In other words, complete pathways, right? Marrying guided pathways to open textbooks, complete, create complete pathways for students based on zero textbook costs, usually using OER, sometimes integrating library materials, library databases, library subscriptions, but zero cost of students. Um, as a result of this project in California that Una and I partnered on, we see the following results. Next slide, please. We see that grades for all, so students who were in these pathways, uh, grades for all students went up. Uh, down in the bottom left of the slide, you'll see that grades of A went up 7%, grades of Ds and Fs dropped double digits. 
so you think about this as an instructor, you know, there were really two interventions. One was moving to OER or zero cost materials. And the other was aligning your courses in a pathway for students. So those two interventions, which are significant institutional undertakings, but those two interventions had, had this result. Um, it's hard for me to think of other interventions that have had similar uh, positive outcomes. Next slide, please. And with that, I'm gonna turn it back over to Una. Okay, so the, the uh, chat discussion is fascinating and I can see we have an economist on uh, in the chat uh, who is, pr is providing some uh, great um, input. Um, so um, this is really about the impact on students of the cost of textbooks. And yes, uh, Jim, um, there are various estimates on the costs of textbooks. Um, so thanks for that input. And I'll let James take a look at some of that too. Um, there's been really some wonderful um, things brought up around textbooks and, and going digital. And I, I do wanna mention that OER doesn't have to be digital. So there, um, I, I hope, some of you have heard of OpenStax, which is the major open textbook publisher for uh, community colleges. And, and they have also moved into doing um, AP uh, textbooks as well. So for high school as well. Um, and over 50% of colleges and universities in the United States use OpenStax textbooks. And um, so we, we know that it is uh, a, a, a working quite successfully. And, um, we don't have the numbers here, but uh, several years ago, it was in 2018, that Spark, which is um, the organization um, that has a focus on open education uh, policy. Um, I, I hope many of you know about Spark and Spark Open. They estimated that, and this was in 2018, that one billion dollars had been saved by students um, since in the last, um, I believe it was the last decade. Um, so there, so there are some very encouraging numbers out there. But um, what this particular uh, survey shows, this is out of Florida. Uh, they have done this survey every two years since 2012, um, and they it, it's um, it's their state universities and their state colleges, and their state colleges are the equivalent of community colleges. Um, but in Florida, they renamed those a number of years ago, and they asked students, um, "What is what is the effect on you of the cost of textbooks?" And so, 64% of students came back and said they didn't purchase the textbook at least sometimes due to cost. Um, many said they took fewer courses uh, or they didn't register for a specific course. And you can see that was about 40%. Uh, what might be even more disturbing is that 35% said, well, I tried to do it without the textbook and guess what, I didn't, I, I didn't do well. So that means they either got a very low grade or they had to retake it. So we know that it's affecting uh, students' ability to complete in a timely manner and, um, six, and to be successful. Um, the Hope Center out of Temple University has been running uh, surveys uh, with colleges around the country uh, focused on students and their basic uh, needs. And as you can see, um, th and this was pre-pandemic, <laughs> um, this was a, over 167,000 students from uh, two-year colleges and universities reported that 39% were food insecure in the last 30 days. 46% uh, were housing insecure. 17% reported that they were homeless. So we know that our students um, are making choices around their education, which may be affecting their health and nutrition on a regular basis. Um, these are not the choices we want our students to be making. And so OER is really um, an equity issue as well, or yes, it helps with that equity issue. You know, tr the traditional look is that, you know, students should be prepared. They should come to class the first day with their textbook. Um, and um, if there are achievement gaps, it's due to, uh, lack of motivation or initiative on these students' parts, and the institution really can't do anything about it. Now, we've changed quite a bit in terms of our view. Uh, I would say, um, I don't think 
all educators ever espouse that, but there certainly was that. And you sometimes still hear that with policymakers, um, both national and state level. Um, but we have really moved in this direction that um, it's important for the students who come to us, it's our responsibility um, to um, help them be successful and to provide those instructional materials. And that is, that is our work to do to help our students. Well, and then the pandemic hit. <laughs> so um, that kind of turned everything on its ear. Um, and I know that, um, you know, in talking with um, folks around the country, you know, we do have members in 35 states. Um, in many cases, it's, it's faculty have who were kind of sitting on the fence post are now looking at OER, they've adopted OER, uh, the digital format can be very helpful in terms of distribution. Um, of course, uh, there are issues around that as well um, for students who maybe don't have access to computers or to high, or to high internet bandwidth. Um, and so that has added to the equity uh, equation, if you will. So um, there was a survey done this fall um, by New America and they talked to students around the country um, 44% of students reported that they bought computers to continue their studies last spring. So a really high number. And 66% of those students said that that was a really significant cost for them. Um, but you will see that 77% of the black students said it was a significant cost. So, so there's a differential there. 37% um, reported this fall that re-enrolling is gonna be very challenging for them, whether it's through job loss, um, or some other challenging life event. Um, the Latinx community um, reported that at 45%, that re-enrolling was gonna be very difficult. Um, and they reported many students work in what you, you would call an essential um, area, which means that they have to be on site to do their work. And so there's been a lot of job losses in that area. So we know that students are impacted even more by the economic situation currently. So, um, and we've had some discussion in the chat window about this as well. So what have institutions been doing? Um, so textbook rentals, of course, that's been around for over a decade and that continues to be uh, um, an area where um, sometimes that's the right solution. Uh, textbook vouchers became very popular in the spring um, where um, institutions were trying to really support their students. Um, sometimes the foundation steps up and uh, can provide additional um, funding for students, not only for um, textbooks, but possibly also for those computers, um, or even in some cases, the hotspots, if students don't have that kind of bandwidth at home, they don't have the internet at home. Uh, but we've seen a huge growth in open educational resources. And um, I'm sorry, I don't have the information in front of me right now, but OpenStax reported last spring this, enormous jump in adoptions uh, in the spring, actually. They reported this in May um, that uh, they'd had this enormous jump. And um, I'm sorry, it's in a blog report on our, our site that this growth has been um, huge in open educational resources um, as faculty and students are both seeing the benefit there. One other thing that's happened is uh, um, automated student billing. And this didn't start with the pandemic, but it's certainly, um, has had the potential to increase. Now, I, I wonder how many of you know what I'm talking about when I say automated student billing, or sometimes it's called first day access or inclusive access. And it's when an institution generally, uh, it's sometimes it's a faculty, but usually it's in an institution um, engages in a contract with a publisher where when students enroll in a class, they are then charged for the materials. So these would be commercial materials um, and the institutions do it because um, the publishers um, generally provide some kind of a discount. So on the face of it, it sounds quite good that it's gonna help reduce costs for students, um, but often there's no um, higher end on the price increasing in the future. And, it, and although 
most contracts require that students can opt out of this. Many courses are now set up that require those materials in order for students to take tests. Um, and and um, so students really effectively have to pay this fee. And the publishers have required often that um, some number like 60% of the students must opt in or they push the price back up to the normal retail price. So it puts the institutions um, in a difficult spot sometimes and particularly students. Um, and um, so we, we created a little matrix for um, our institutions that were looking at automated billing um, and compared it with open educational resources. And the, it, I don't have time to go into a lot of detail on this, but it, it really requires that an institution look at the fine print before they endorse uh, this. Um, and it also, it also makes students kind of a sitting, um, they're, they're, they become a customer directly of that publisher and um, students usually have to set up some kind of an account and so student data is involved, the exchange of student data and inst institutions, uh, I'm sorry, the publishers sometimes market then directly to students for these digital materials. So it's, um, it's an area that we're watching closely. And um, in fact, we had a student join us uh, for one of our monthly webinars in October. And she talked about how um, automate, she happens to be out of Tennessee Community Colleges, which did have a big effort around automated billing about a year ago. And she said the costs for her and her family, because she has a number of um, children who are all also enrolled in college right now, has actually increased. Uh, they don't have options for buying used books. Uh, if they buy their textbooks, they, uh, now that you don't buy textbooks, it's digital materials and it goes away at the end of the semester, there's no opportunity to sell back. And so in fact, it's costing her more at this point. So we have a lovely interview with her on our website if you'd like to hear more. So, you know, uh, Jim and Glenn and a number of you talked about um, the textbook costs and open ed is really more than just about textbook costs. It's really about giving you the faculty, the freedom uh, to bring in materials, develop materials if you choose that really meet your, your teaching style and your student needs, your course requirement. And so this is sometimes referred to as open pedagogy or OER enabled pedagogy. And those rights that you as a faculty member get um, can also be given to your students if you so choose to have them co-curate or even um, co-create with you instructional materials. And here's a few examples um, from around the country on this work. Um, and um, I'll start on the left uh, is a memoir. Uh, it's, a, it's a book of memoirs that was created at, in one of the CUNY community colleges. There are stories, uh, they're all um, students who are immigrants to this country and they, um, ha they have published their memoirs in this particular book. Um, and it's all licensed with a Creative Commons license, which means you can reuse that um, in your classroom in any way you would like, as long as you give attribution to the student author. Um, Montgomery Community College has been running an open pedagogy faculty fellowship for the last um, three years. It's based on the UN sustainability development goals, uh, but faculty can apply for this fellowship um, and they create what are called renewable assignments with their students. And these assignments um, are, are chosen by the students with uh, faculty input on uh, various areas. Um, so the one I'm gonna talk about in my breakout session is around anthropology and where students were able to choose an anthropology community, a community uh, and investigate the primary sources and then create a video um, which is openly licensed and shared. Um, so, and you can see there's some really wonderful ones. I'm gonna, the last one I'm gonna touch on here is the, um, the early childhood education textbook there in the upper right-hand corner. That was actually developed at James's College. Um, 
and at College of the Canyons in Southern California. And um, James, James's team has a group of student workers who help faculty with the formatting of their textbooks, uh, create usually the, um, the covers of the textbook uh, for the faculty, um, help them with accessibility issues uh, to make sure that uh, the textbooks are formatted so that students with disabilities can use those textbooks uh, adequate, you know, as the same as um, other students. Um, so there are just so many opportunities for getting students involved in the in their own education, their ownership, uh, building skills that will t help them be successful when they graduate and move into the um, move full time into um, the workplace. And many of these are also um, in um, a an um, in an online resource called the Open Pedagogy Notebook. And if any of you are interested in that, I highly recommend you um, take a look at the Open Pedagogy Notebook. You can Google that. And it has some wonderful examples from around the country, both community college and universities. Uh, because the bottom one here on the ecological approach to obesity and eating disorders is actually um, a health textbook that was developed by upper division students at Clemson University. Um, so just amazing work being done by students um, and the open licensing, the open practices is supporting this work. Back to you, James. Great. Thanks, Una. Appreciate that. And, and I want to look at a few more examples of this, this opportunity to uh, co-curate and work with students uh, and, and also to thoughtfully uh, tackle equity issues. Um, when, when material is openly licensed, which legally gives you the permission to edit it and change it, uh, you can do some things that you can't do with uh, commercial textbooks that are not that don't give you that permission. So let's take a look at uh, uh, names, uh, the importance of naming. At my institution, uh, pretty simply, uh, we we sometimes will receive manuscripts or or text from our our senior faculty members that refer to uh, examples in, that, that write examples in the textbook referring to Joe and Sally, and and my staff changes those names to Jose and Maria because of course. Those are the names that our students actually have uh, these days. Um, but I want to start talking about a couple more examples. So I'm an historian by training. And uh, one of the things that uh, we've seen over the past couple of years is a heightened awareness of the way in which, uh, let's say, uh, uh, lies our teachers have told us or the ways in which uh, there are gaps in, uh, in the stories we tell ourselves about American history. An example that's been in the news uh, over the past couple of years is the Tol what was once referred to as the Tulsa race riot. Um, and many race, quote unquote, riots across the United States in our history, uh, in which uh, uh, communities, uh, com white communities have attacked black communities, burned them down. Um, the Tulsa race riot in 1921 uh, uh, was an example of this. Hundreds of hundreds of white, white, uh, white residents attacked uh, the black part of, uh, of Tulsa, uh, what was known as the Black Wall Street, burned it to the ground. 300 people died, 6,000 people uh, rounded up into camps, uh, 1,500 homes destroyed, et cetera, et cetera. And again, for nearly a century, this was referred to in textbooks as the Tulsa race riot. Uh, over the past couple of years, it has been changed to the Tulsa race massacre. Now, if you're an, histor uh, an historian or teaching history the way I, I used to, uh, you could look back in your textbooks and probably your textbook wouldn't even mention this, but if it did, and I found this in one of my old textbooks, it referred to the Tulsa race riot. Uh, so if you're working with a commercial textbook, you cannot change that as our knowledge evolves. But if you were working with an open textbook that re reinforced this notion of the Tulsa race riot and used the outdated, uh, dare I say racist term, uh, you, if it were an openly licensed uh, textbook, you could change that and update that. And in fact, you could work with your students to update the information in your textbook to more uh, accurately reflect the ways in which we view history today. Uh, another example, uh, going to the STEM area, going to biology, next slide please, Una. thank you very much, uh, is in our biology textbooks and uh, particularly uh, medical school textbooks, medical school books. Um, in 2018, a study in the from the University of Washington examined uh, 8,000 images in the four most widely used introductory textbooks in medical school. And guess what, folks? According to these four 
most widely used uh, textbooks, the entire human race only has white skin. You know, who would have thought it? Um, and, and that's not only a matter of, you know, negative representation in these, in these materials, but it's also a matter of life and death. If our physicians are not trained to recognize uh, illnesses uh, on skin other than white, uh, people are diagnosed late or uh, incorrectly diagnosed. Um, in one of the textbooks, uh, Atlas of Human Anatomy, uh, fewer than 1% of the images had, uh, had skin other than white. And in the guide to physical examination and history taking, uh, only 8% of the images had uh, in, portrayed skin other than white. So again, this is a, an image, I mean, this is an, an issue that goes beyond representation. It's, it's a matter of life and death sometimes. So if you're a biology faculty member, uh, take a look at your books. If it's a commercial book and you, you identify this issue, you can't do anything about it. If it's an open textbook that comes with this issue, if it's an open textbook, you could work together with your students to change the images. It would be a wonderful research, research uh, project for your students to find relevant, it, relevant images of non-white skin and insert those into an updated version of your textbook. Take a look at the uh, Instagram account, Brown Skin Matters. Uh, one, one image at a time, that Instagram account is trying to fill in the gaps in uh, in uh, medical images. So uh, next slide, please. Also uh, accessibility matters. We see the, we, we unfortunately uh, know that, uh, the, uh, that when commercial texts sometimes, or certainly the commercial uh, websites sometimes uh, discriminate against our students with disabilities, so too, unfortunately, sometimes uh, open textbooks are produced uh, without alt text, without headers, without captions. Uh, we know that happens. Uh, again, the key difference is that with a commercial book or commercial materials, you can't touch it. You can't change it. With openly licensed materials, you can work, perhaps work together with your disability services department, identify some students, student workers, uh, student assistants to work with you and your class on a project, updating the material, uh, in the textbook so that it is in fact accessible and compliant with the law. Next slide, please. Uh, on a slightly, slightly different topic. Uh, policies also matter. Uh, policies around open. Uh, we see an increasing number of states, uh, foundations, funders, uh, and even institutions that require material produced with their funding. So uh, to, to be openly licensed, sort of following under the, the motto of if the taxpayers are paying for it, the taxpayers should be able to use it. So the, the greatest example or the, 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 the highest level example we see of this is the US, US Department of Education as well as the US Department of Labor uh, state in their grant terms that if you receive a grant, if you're an educational institution receiving a grant uh, to produce, produce content or curriculum, that material or curriculum has to be openly licensed so that the taxpayers can use what the taxpayers have paid for. I'm not sure what the uh, situation is in Colorado, but I know our friend Spencer has joined us. Welcome, Spencer. Uh, I'm sure he, he can fill us uh, in on that. So uh, back to you, Una. All right. Yes, I, I noticed Spencer joined us too. That's, that's fun. Ah, for the grant recipients. Okay, perfect. That they do require an open license. All right. Well, we wanted to give you some time to uh, answer questions. So I just want to give you a little overview of uh, why you might want to join the community. Um, Front Range is a member of CCCOER. So um, all of our events, of course, are open to you, but um, you may need to um, sign up for our community email list. Um, so that's very easy. You simply go to our website under Get Involved and uh, click on Community Email and you can join if you're not there already. Um, and um, we have a really expert community, over 1,600 folks from around the country, um, actually internationally, for also from Canada, and sometimes a few um, from other places around the world who weigh in on questions. So you put a question out there, chances are uh, you'll have, within a few hours, you'll have several responses to uh, requests for OER or uh, questions about uh, how licensing works, et cetera. Uh, we do have um, monthly webinars. We also love to showcase work and uh, we really need to do a showcase on some of the great work being do done at Front Range and share that on our website. So do go to our website. We have lots of resources. Uh, 
around getting started, finding OER um, that uh, we hope will be helpful to you. Um, this is just a list of uh, the webinars from uh, last fall, uh, a few of them. I couldn't fit them all on the screen. I do wanna say we had uh, uh, Joe Brankert from math, from your math department with us uh, last, I'm gonna say last September, I think Joe joined us to talk about ju just the amazing work he's doing around um, equity in his classroom. Uh, he talked about his syllabus, how he has changed that up. And I'm gonna talk about it in my breakout session about that great work he's doing um, and just other work that he's doing to be more open, uh, what we call open practices in his class so that uh, students are on a level playing field there. Um, and um, these are an opportunity for you to learn and share. You can ask questions. We invite thought leaders, experts, practitioners, primarily practitioners in open. So it's a really wonderful opportunity. We hope you'll join us for those. Um, we also started our Regional Leaders of Open Education um, effort in 2019, and it's really about sharing information across uh, state boundaries um, so that um, we can eliminate duplicate efforts. And for, for states that are, um, you know, maybe just a few steps behind um, other states that have been doing OER for a long time, it's a great opportunity to learn. And I'm very pleased to say that Spencer Ellis um, has been um, part of um, that effort and also Brittany Dudak um, out of um, the community college system office. Uh, and we also, if you have an interest in joining um, that effort, we'd love to hear from you. And finally, I just wanted to mention Open Education Week is coming up uh, Mar March, the first week of March. It's an opportunity to showcase your open education projects with a global audience. You can submit that. Um, there's usually a series of webinars throughout that week um, that that are open to all. So you can hear about great projects that are going on. Um, many colleges, and I, I wonder if Molly and other folks on her council um, use this as an opportunity to, to provide um, college-based um, advocacy around OER as well. Often those are in person, but um, probably not this year. Um, but it's, it's a really great time to celebrate uh, the successes and the potential for open education. And this site uh, above and beyond letting you submit the great work you're doing, it also has um, graphical uh, materials that you can use to create posters and other digital uh, materials this year um, to share with folks. And I think we're open for Q&A. Thanks, and I just wanna say front range, you have a strong chat game, wow. <laughs> you know, we, we've been, I, over the past year, I think a lot of us have participated in virtual events and front range, you guys are killing it in the chat. This is, that, that's great. It's uh, a, a lot of, uh, yeah, as, as Kenneth points out, you miss each other, that's great. It's a, it's a strong, strong sign of community. So that, I, I really admire that. And it's, it's been good to see, um, you know, differences of opinion, but respectful differences of opinion um, and all trying to, you know, really um, move forward. And so that, it's really exciting to see that. So with that, with that very strong chat game, uh, we would uh, suggest that if you, if you do have questions, please, please feel, feel free to unmute yourself and verbalize those questions. It's a, it's a pretty dang big, big chat chat thread for us to work our way through. So if you still have some burning questions, please uh, please feel free to verbalize those. So James, uh, this is Glenn Smith. I teach political science and I, I can find no end of options for US government. Um, but intro, which I think would, I would have assumed would have been more prevalent um, on, a, on an early dive in, I cannot, actually find an intro, uh, an open source intro book. Uh, any suggestions? Wow, uh, uh, that's a great question, Glenn, thanks. Um, off the top of my head, I can think of some US government, right? I can think of some US government text, but I, I can't off the top of my head think of intro to poli-sci. Uh, we did have a, we did have, um, Alan Hancock did a political science uh, Z pathway. Yeah, so we'll, we'll not look into that. Yeah, it may not be entirely open, um, Glenn. It, it may be um, some zero cost as well. Also, we have a colleague we'll be doing an event with next week who is a OER advocate and a 
professor of political science. So maybe we could ask her as well. That's correct. Yeah, uh, Dr. Shauna Brandel out of um, CUNY, out of the City University of New York system. Excellent, thank you, Glenn. Yeah, and you know, Glenn, um, email that to us so that we can follow up because um, I'm taking notes, but I often lose them, <laughs> the paper notes. <laughs> Any other questions? Well, also, Glenn, let me, before I, before we move on, uh, I, I, I don't know from the chat, I didn't quite catch it, if there's a, if there's a librarian uh, here or if you have somebody in your, in your library team who, who works with OER, uh, that's often your best first stop is to chat with your librarians. Absolutely. Yeah, uh, we, our current librarian, I assume, uh, literally started like a week before we went into the COVID lockdown. Oh, um, wow. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was it was kind of a harsh introduction for them. Well, at Glenn, I would um, I would invite you to reach out to him or her and invite them to join our email list. Um, and I'd be very happy to um, have a phone call with that librarian too, if you know, and let them know about resources we have, um, if that would be helpful. I know there's a great deal going on in Colorado as well with your ambassador program. Um, and I know you had um, open textbook network training as well, um, but I think that was a little earlier. Yeah, I'm, I'm part of me is almost thinking of, of dabbling into pieces of it, you know, going the, my intro textbook just got a new edition. So I think I'm okay with it for a little bit. Um, although the difference between it and the previous edition so far is pretty, pretty limited. Um, but the publisher, of course, is not supporting the previous edition at all. Um, so, and they, they were pushing really hard on that integrated uh, system. In fact, last semester, I had one student that inadvertently bought the, um, it's Pearson, so I, I, their Revel uh, account. And she was like, well, yeah, I need you to unlock it. And I'm like, I have no idea what you're talking about. I don't what, you know, and so I had to figure out that she had bought the wrong module of their, you know, because they have the they have the hardback, they have the online, and then they have this incorporated rebel thing. And, you know, as soon as Pearson found out about that, they were jumping on me to, you know, to sign up for it. I'm like, no, <laughs> you know, I have my own curriculum. Thank you. I just happen to use your book. Yeah. And yeah. also in the in the chat, Kate Kate points out that a, a, another one of your campuses is having a similar issue. So that might be an opportunity to collaborate on a compilation. Uh, and, and, you know, to take a step back, uh, there are sort of three bundles of uh, or three categories of ways people might engage in OER. The the sort of quote unquote easy one would be adopting a book that somebody else made, right? Adopt something that OpenStax made, adopt something that College of the Candies made. Okay, it's just like adopting a new book. Adaptation is sort of that middle road, right? You, 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 you work with your librarians or your OER team here and you find uh, three or four open, openly licensed uh, versions of the material that, that are kind of sort of what you're looking for and you undertake this Lego approach and you start putting together different chapters and building building a compilation or a collection that kind of resembles a textbook. A lot of times in those situations, a faculty or a group of faculty might uh, write transitions or might write uh, material that gives a local context to, to, the, uh, to, the, to the work. Uh, and then the, the final biggest, hardest uh, undertaking would be to author uh, something on your own, right? adopt, adapt, or author. So there, there's a continuum. So uh, yeah, I encourage you to consider a collaboration with colleagues across Colorado. Create a, create a compendium of uh, intro to poli-sci for Colorado. And that's a question for Spencer. Spencer, do you think there'll be a fourth round of funding? I'm putting Spencer on the spot. I'm not sure if Spencer is still with us. <laughs> that's okay. And, and Glenn, there are a lot, a lot of folks in the chat offering to, to help out. So that's great. Um, and then I know Stacy, Stacy said she kind of had a joke question. Go for it, Stacy. Can you argue healthcare to Congress for us too? Are we what? 
I said, can you argue healthcare for us? I like your, uh, <laughs> this should not cost money. <laughs> oh man. I think we will. So we'll send James yeah. to Congress. <laughs> no. Well, I, you know, in a serious way, Stacey, I really appreciate that. I really appreciate the, 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 the question because I don't, I don't mean to advance any, you know, partisan, partisan uh, position, but I think oftentimes solutions to problems elude us because we're not willing to shift our perspective and look at things from, from a different, you know, from a different perspective. So yeah. Uh, yeah, that's that's my response to that. <laughs> yeah. And I'll say this again, as a as a certified bean counting paper pushing administrator, I'll tell you an ugly secret. There's always money. <laughs> Sorry, Gene, but there's always money. It's a matter of of prioritizing uh, what an, what uh, what you want to do. <laughs> <laughs>